Abaddon's 14th Black Crusade, or Abaddon Quest on TG, is a series of threads created by a far TG UI named simply as op that focuses on the posters being Abaddon the Despoiler. It's famous on TG because it's co-created by the denizens of TG as a whole, not solely just by op, although he does tell how the story goes. Far TG UYS suggest what happens next by rolling a d100 in the thread, the one with the highest score, or the numbers 66, 77, 88, and 99, which are the sacred number of the chaos gods and thus must be written for chaos itself speaks, gets his story written by op in the most awesome source lulzy way possible. Needless to say, the collaborative effort now turned Abaddon from an armless failure to a badass worthy of a bow. Part 1 Abaddon the Despoiler, the War Master of Chaos and the current leader of the Black Legion, as the head of countless fanatical servants of the ruinous powers. You would think that he would be the most feared mortal being in the universe right now. Even Abaddon himself is starting to realize how much of a joke his title is. Tsinch mocks him for being so predictable. Korn constantly tells him how Khan has more kills than him and how Angren has gotten more things done than him in a single millennium. The rest of the Chaos Primarchs laughs at him for his incompetence as the supposed War Master of Chaos and Blessed of the Chaos Gods. He would want to hold his head in his armored hands right about now in shame. If only he had his arms back. He did manage to stop Kerus sacrificing the blood ravens from ascending into demonhood by having Elephus kill him and getting the favor of the chaos gods with the sacrifice of an entire sector. But the rest of the chaos champions still say that despoiling a crippled chapter isn't really a feat for an entire chaos legion, especially when Sir Chapter managed to kick their initial attack force back with nothing more than three space marine squads and a single captain. Abaddon now sits on his throne in his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, currently in the Eye of Terror and about to exit into real space. He ponders for a moment what he has become today. Is he really still a fit being in the despoiler of the universe or is he just another generic chaos lord with a fancy title? He then closes his eyes, takes a deep breath, and opens his eyes with determination that he is still the feared war master of chaos as he was always been. He realized the reason why he defined the false emperor, murdered his own brothers in arms who did not accept the true power, and why he lives today to serve the true powers, to pay tribute to the dark gods, and that is enough to drive him to continue on. Besides, plenty of sacrifices are to be had during his crusades with either the blood of loyalists or servants of the true powers. He shouts on his vox, servants of chaos, hear me now the corpse worshipping fools of the imperium shall fall today under the relentless will of chaos. For today we march for our 14th Black Crusade the Chaos Gods assure me that this blackened crusade will be triumphant let the galaxy boo and the ship's crew is stunned for a few seconds after hearing that, they just know in the back of their minds that this crusade won't be different from the rest, and pray to the Chaos Gods for deliverance. Abaddon, now empowered by the prospect of a possible major victory over the Imperium of Man, exits his throne room, where he is greeted by his juster in Terminator bodyguards. Abaddon then realizes one crucial flaw that would greatly undermine his efforts. He still has no arms. He grins for a moment in anger, then one of Abaddon's juster in bodyguards asks, What troubles you? My Lord Abaddon then throws the weight of his Terminator armor at the interrogating bodyguard, knocking him down, and screams, I require a new set of arms get me a pair right now you miserable wretch ah, right away, my leech, p, please forgive me, says the stunned Terminator. The Terminator leads Abaddon to the ship's armory, where a contingent of Iron Warriors Marines and numerous servitors can be seen maintaining the Legion's hardware in preparation for the newest Black Crusade. Abaddon enters the main armory, seeing an Iron Warriors Marine polishing a melted gun on his lap, seemingly in some weird form of slanishy like pleasure as his rag runs across the now shining metal on the weapon. Upon seeing Abaddon, the warrior is broken from his trance, frantically puts the weapon away, faces Lord Abaddon and says, why yes, Lord Abaddon what is it you wish Abaddon, slightly disturbed over the marine's weapon fetish, thuds the iron warrior with his terminator armor and demands a new set of arms, the marine scrambles to the room next to the armory, where hundreds of dark servitors are making weapons, 
After a few hours, the marine returns back with a new pair of bionic arms, hard enough to withstand a crack missile and large enough to fit the bulk of the Terminator armor. A retinue of servitors led by a dark mechanicus tech priest rush to their lord's location, where they fit the newly made arms on their liege. Abaddon takes a moment and flexes his new arms. They feel like his old ones. He then smashes a servitor to test the hardness of his new appendages. The lobotomized contraption is left a twisted ruin after Abaddon gives it a clothesline. And then he leaves the armory with great joy. Abaddon then returns to his throne room and enters the inner sanctum located behind it, where his trophies, weapons, and other icons can be located. He goes to a chest in the middle of the room, filled with some of his prized trophies and mementos. He takes particular interest in the skull of his first kill. An orc with the right side of its skull blown off after his bolt rounds pierce through the green skin's head. Another is a recollection of images of the entire Mornival in a group shot before their first combat action as a group. Their faces look on high and proud. He then reminisces about a few more things such as a ceramide shard of Horus armor, a peculiar cylindrical and somewhat phallic slanashi instrument gifted to him by Lucius the Eternal of which he never learned the purpose of, and a recorded transmission of Khan saying how exhilarating Talaran was while holding the severed head of a trooper. Enough nostalgia he said to himself and he drew out the talon of Horus and Drachnian from their dark altars. Abaddon then plots out how he is going to convince the rest of the Chaos Legions to lend him aid. His past failures are sure to be a discouraging fact to the rest of them. However, after meditating and psychically conversing with Sinch about his next plans, he is then given the knowledge on how to gather another legion of chaotic zealots. He contacts one of his favored servants, Eliphas the Inheritor and charges him with the propaganda operations. As a word bearer dark apostle, he is bound to be well versed on how to spread the word and will of chaos. Abaddon however, still feels a little uneasy with his new arms. While powerful, decades of being limbless have taken its toll on him and he fears his martial prowess is not as good as they used to be. As a test, he orders a group of Slanashi cultists to summon a host of demonet to his throne room, which they promptly did and they appeared in the center of his throne room. He then proceeds to take a seat on his throne. The seductive forms of the servants of Slanesh and Tysabaton, his blood rushing as they lay themselves on his armor. Even with the thick layers of ceramide covering his body, he could feel the sensual form of the demons as if his armor were his own flesh. Then they whispered to his ear, you may do whatever you wish to us, great and mighty champion. Abaddon is drowned in an ocean of pleasure for a few moments as the demonettes rub themselves around him, moving their fingers around his body, and arousing him with an elegant and seductive dance. He then snaps out of the moment and remembers what he was supposed to do in the first place. He proceeds to grab the first demonette by the head with his right armored fist and crush the hapless demon's skull through brute force. Then second one, still shocked at the situation, is flayed and killed after a flurry of attacks from Abaddon's Talon of Horus. The third one is now circling Abaddon and poised to strike. He deflects a quick succession of attacks from the demon using Drachnion and raises up his Talon to fire a burst from his Storm Bolter, which the demon avoids with her incredibly fast moves. She jumps up into the air and attempts to behead Abaddon with its claw, but is cast short after the despoiler charges up into the air and knocks the demonette down with his shoulder. The demon pleads for mercy but Abaddon had none of it, he then raises her over his head and forcefully rips her in two and discards her now broken corpse aside. Abaddon then spreads out his arms and howls in victory and glee that his combat prowess is as potent as they were decades ago. He then looks around his throne room and stares at the mangled remains of the demonettes, bloodied and utterly destroyed. Oddly, a powerful temptation then engulfs him. The thoughts of desires of slanesh and violence from corn possess his mind and body like a persistent demon. He then proceeds to test his arms on the deceased demonettes in a different way. It would appear that Slanesh has blessed his mechanical arms as he could feel every bit of grotesque sensation from his debauched acts as if his arms were his own flesh. After 5 minutes of debased deeds that are best left untold, Abaddon gets in his vox and announces to the ship on how he sexually violated a dead trio of demonettes. 
a large portion of the Black Legion's warriors could only listen in horror at this heresy, except for the Slanesh aligned marines who cheered him on and one berserker who commented, serves those effete scum right glory to your lord Abaddon. Abaddon then conjures up a bolt of Empyrean warp fire to burn the corpses of the demonette and exits his throne room. His Juster in Terminator bodyguards just giving him a puzzled and horrified look at his deeds that even they consider heresy. He walks through the ship's halls, gaining the praise of the Slanish cultists and marines. The warriors of excess then follows him, making offers of more debauched forms of pleasure with the war master, with some offering to have their rear armor penetrated by him. After a few moments of indulgence, Abaddon the despoiler decides to let these trivial pursuits slide and get on with his plan of a new black crusade. His next act was to enlist the other champions of chaos to further fuel his goals. The chosen servants of the dark gods are sure not to fail him. Many champions go through his mind. Perhaps he should summon the aid of Khan the betrayer first or maybe Doombreed. Korn's most powerful champion or maybe the last champion of Slanesh. Doomridder he considered Angron. However the two are not in good terms so he decides not to get him to fight under his wing. After much time to think on who to call on first, he finally decides to enlist the help of the Thousand Sun's most powerful sorcerer. As a Kariman, Abaddon then gathers his cabal of sorcerers to establish a psychic link with the wandering champion of Tsinj. Ahriman was quick to notice the link between them even before Abaddon had a chance to speak and says to him, Our great Abaddon the Despoiler, what is it you wish you speak to me about nothing important or of value? I assume, do you need my consul did you lose your appendages again and require my aid to find them? Again, Ahriman says with a sarcastic tone. Abaddon then details his plan of another black crusade to Ahriman. The latter laughs at the prospect of another crusade of failure and says, Oh how innovative you are Abaddon. Truly, Chaos Greatest War Master is a pinnacle of creativity. He is interrupted when Abaddon mentions that his crusade may have them pass where the Black Library is located. Aram and then resumes. Also, perhaps I do know where you arms are. But what was that you said about the Black Library let us discuss more about that. Shall we Abaddon then says that what he said about the elusive craft world was false. He only mentions the Black Library as a way to get the insolent sorcerer to listen for a moment. Angrily, Araman replies, Then why in the name of scene should I bother to join you? You overrated fool of a war master you will just lead your warriors into their pointless graves and your entire fleet will fall to a single Cadian general and his army of weak and fragile children brandishing flashlights so predictable of you. Abaddon, holding his temper, then mentions that his crusade will not be as predictable now, for he considers the prospect of time travel, which again intrigues the sorcerer. Wading through trivial facts Abaddon asks if this is indeed possible. Ahriman tells him that it is indeed possible with enough sorcery mustard to rend the fabric of time itself. He asks when this will begin and Abaddon says that it will commence now. Ahriman then pledges his allegiance to the despoiler and tells him that he will ready his cabal to twist the warp. He urges Abaddon not to disturb him as he prepares the ritual to do so as this is a very delicate and volatile spell that cannot afford any flaws, which Abaddon agrees to, and then breaks off the psychic link with Ahriman. As the war master continues to plot within the confines of his throne room along with his cabal of sorcerers, Eliphas suddenly enters the chamber, while already a demon prince of corn, he assumes his old form of a terminator lord while off battle as this sweets him better. He comes to Lord Abaddon to report a slight bump in the propaganda efforts. Lord Abaddon, we have a slight problem. We have just realized that the fleet does not have enough paper in stock to print all of our 10 trillion leaflets to spread the word of the newest Black Crusade. Abaddon puts his face on his armored palm at the direction of Eliphas and says, Tell me, little Eliphas, are you really this unresourceful? No my lord, it's just that. Eliphas was cast by Abaddon who proceeds. Quiet worm, I am not done speaking. Now, we have millions upon millions of hapless slaves and followers devout to chaos. What do you think their use is? Abaddon asks. Their, um, their use is to serve chaos with their lives. My lord, Eliphas asks with an unsure tone. Precisely, my little Eliphas. Now what are you going to do now? Abaddon asks further, 
Are you implying that I'm supposed to skin the slaves and use their skins as paper? My lord. Abaddon does not speak. He just gives a facial gesture to answer Eliphas' question, which Eliphas understands and leaves the throne room. Minutes later, hordes of slaves are brought into the vengeful spirit, where a large contingent of Slanashi cultists or marines were charged with the joyous duty of skinning the slaves alive as so their skins can use as leaflets. It would have also worked if they were already dead, but Eliphas knows that the followers of Slanesh will work faster if their victim is still a screaming mess. Hours of non-stop screaming could be heard through the halls of the accursed ship, which made the crew uneasy, slightly annoyed the astarts, and gave an orgasmic glee to the servants of Slanesh. All is going well. This crusade might turn up to be a successful one, Abaddon confidently said to himself as he continues to think on which chaos champion to summon next. Who else to call upon for this black crusade? Hum. What about Lord Baal and the sorcerer Sindri Mit? The despoiler asks his cabal. They are, uh, both dead my lord, says one of the sorcerers. Nareth, who was standing beside the naive sorcerer, thumps his fellow Sikari in the back of his armored head and counters. Sindri is already a demon price. You fool, we can summon his essence so he could aid us. Haha, <laughs> very well. Form a psychic link with the demon prince's essence so I may converse with him. Abaddon commands his sorcerers. After three of Abaddon's sorcerers violently dying and one turning into a gibbering wreck trying to find Sindri through the war, the rest finally succeeded. Even though Abaddon is the only one with the psychic link to Sindri, the demon prince's booming voice could be heard throughout the vengeful spirit who said, What do you want from me? Mortal break away now before I shatter your souls Abaddon is infuriated at the demon's lack of respect to the most powerful champion of the chaos gods and through the blessing of Tsin. Abaddon's words somehow subdued Sindri's rage as he spoke and garnered a bit of his compliance, and so the demon listens to the war master more calmly. Sindri then asks, in his Slanashi blessed voice, what do you wish? Lord Abaddon the despoiler. Abaddon feels like his mind is in a state of great bliss when he heard the demon speak in his old voice. Abaddon briefs Sindri on his plan for a new black crusade and asks for his assistance which the demon agrees to. He only requires that he be summoned into the material plane, which Abaddon plans to do by sacrificing one of his sorcerers. A sorcerer from his cabal gladly comes forth to be a sacrifice. Abaddon, however, is having doubts whether to sacrifice his few remaining sorcerers to bring a demon back into real space. He will need the rest to summon more champions and he is in short supply of competent sickers due to Sindri killing a good number of them. He then tells his sorcerers to instead open a warp rift where Sindri is, which they do in short succession. What are you doing, mortal? Sindri asks as he is not sure what Abaddon is planning. Against everything logical, Abaddon plunges his right arm into the warp and tries to pull out Sindri into real space which astounds everyone in the room. He pulls the thrashing demon with all his superhuman might as Sindri continues to threaten Abaddon. The demon prince then screams, What are you doing you pompous fool release me now and I will promise you a quick death for your insolence. The metal on Abaddon's new arms start to buckle and crack as he tries to pull the demon out of the warp. He then switches to his left arm as he fears that his right arm will eventually break under the stress. Abaddon is close to grabbing Sindri out of the warp, but as his warp exposed arm continues to wrestle with the demon prince, it also starts to tear and disintegrate. Abaddon starts to fear that he is not powerful enough to pull the demon prince out of the warp with his own two hands and he also fears loosing his arms, which he greatly intends not to happen again. Suddenly when all seems lost, Abaddon glows with a blue-hued energy in the marks of Sinch that adorn his Terminator armor and skin glows brightly. It seems that the changer of ways himself comes to aid the War Master in an instant. Abaddon's arms repair themselves instantly and he is brimming with the great power granted by Lord Sinch himself. Using this newly found reserve of power, the despoiler pulls the thrashing demon with all his might and after a few tense moments succeeded in pulling Sindri out of the warp. No one, even the sorcerers, cannot believe what their lord has just done. Abaddon raises his right arm in triumph. Sindri appears as a purple wisp of warp energy in front of everyone. It is at the same time, infuriated and amazed at what just happened right now, 
he continues to emanate psychic screams as he stands on Abaddon's hand, which is causing moderate discomfort amongst the cabal. Abaddon then orders Sindri to be bound to his right arm. The demon is then compelled to take residence in the despoiler's right hand. No no, I will not be bound by you, mortal, protests Sindri but to no avail. Abaddon along with his sorcerers successfully managed to infuse Sindri's essence into Lord Abaddon's right bionic arm. The war master then spreads out his arms, looks up, and levitates as the powers of the warp continue to fill his body. It was somewhat painful, but in a sadistically enjoyable sense. When Abaddon starts to infuse Sindri, he began to feel the demon prince's power flowing in his body. The dark blessings and magics of Tsinge the insatiable bloodlust and great strength of corn, and the debauched sensations given by Slanesh. As he comes down to the ground after successfully gaining the powers of the demon prince, the Slanashi part of the powers appear to be the most overwhelming of all, compared to the others. The price of excess Imha itself whispers to the war master about invoking in some perverted pleasures right now in his throne room, which Abaddon could not refuse. He then walks back to his throne and sits. Then Abaddon starts to remove his Terminator armor's codpiece. Um, Lord Abaddon, what are you? Asks Nerith as he is starting to realize where this is going. By the chaos gods, shouts the entire cabal as Abaddon starts to, um, pleasure himself with his demonically possessed right arm. The sorcerers then start to slowly back away from Lord Abaddon as they see him commit acts of heresy. While Sindri is being mentally scared for his eternal life, he screams for the war master to stop, but to no avail. After a minute of acts that drove most of the cabal even more insane from either the continuous psychic scream Sindri was doing throughout the agonizing minute, or simply seeing their war master in that predicament. Abaddon then proceeds to put his cod piece back on and kissed his right hand that triggered another agonized psychic scream from Sindri who is now scarred in all senses of the word, while his sorcerers are still whimpering in a corner. As the sorcerers battled to regain their already slipping sanity, Abaddon commanded that another champion be called for his crusade. This time, he has decided to enlist the help of Lucius the Eternal, one of Slanesh's greatest champions and a master swordsman. The sorcerers easily find the soul thief and soon a psychic link is established between the war master and the champion lucius welcomes the presence of the war master and asks what he requires of him abaddon asks lucius for his participation in his latest black crusade which the champion of slanesh gleefully obliges to join without a doubt now that another champion joins the ranks the despoiler thinks of another champion to call upon. He now decides to call upon Typhus the Traveler, the great herald of Papa Nurgle. Much like Lucius, the herald of Nurgle welcomes Abaddon's presence, though albeit annoyed as the former was still feeding his kittens. It's always been a great mystery amongst the Chaos Legions how Typhus managed to even own kittens in the first place that didn't die outright from being near him. Given how Typhus is the a host of the destroyer plague, and how Papa Nurgle wants all to decay. The explanation that the Terminator champion simply insists that he likes his kittens adorable as they are, not decayed and dead, and he somehow made them immune to the myriad of plagues and pestilence abundant within a Nurgle worshipping legion, of the which does not seem to garner the wrath of Nurgle. Typhus then speaks in a raspy, phlegm ridden voice. Greetings Lord Abaddon the Despoiler. What is it you require gasp I am in the middle of gasp fee eating my kittens gasp. Abaddon then voices his opinion on how he prefers canines over felines, saying how cats are for fools, which offends the Herald of Nurgle. Enraged, Typhus threatens in a slightly more clearer voice. Go you dare insult my adorable little pets dogs do nothing but bark and bite all the time, which is annoying in all senses of that word. Give me one good reason why I should not take delight in seeing you slowly rot right now when I send my wave of plagues which even you cannot resist a bad and then realizes his error and calms down the enraged herald of Nurgle by apologizing about the previous remark, lest he finds himself surrounded by a swarm of warp flies that would infest his body until it explodes. He then asks the host of the destroyer hive to aid him in his 14th black crusade, which might take them to a planet inhabited solely by cats, which Typhus is greatly jovial about. 
He then responds in a more reserved voice, Very well Lord Abaddon, my plague ships will arrive shortly to rendezvous with you, and the psychic link breaks off. Meanwhile, Araman reports that his fleet is near the vengeful spirit and that he is ready to enact the final ritual to bend the warp and make time travel possible. Abaddon responds that all is not ready yet as he still needs to call upon a few more champions of chaos. He then decides to finally call upon his longtime friend, Khan the Betrayer and commands his cabal to make it so. They successfully locate Khan but nothing happens. They do not see his image nor manage to establish a psychic link with him. One of the sorcerers then ask, Um, did we get the ritual wrong? Another explains, it might be his collar of corn preventing us from thud. What was that? So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedgear.co.uk. One stop shop for coom jar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and dnd 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. The sorcerer is interrupted by a loud noise outside a bad throne room. As it gets closer it sounds like a chimera tank and the howling of a berserker. As it was finally apparent that the sound is coming towards them. Everyone in the room took cover as Khan crashed into the room. Riding on top of a hellhound tank screaming at the top of his lungs while two traitor guardsmen from the Red Rivers were fearfully about to crash the thing and go out in a blaze of glory. Taking out a stunned sorcerer along the way when he got run over by the speeding tank. Khan then yells, don't worry Lord Abaddon, I'll save you, as he raises up Gora Child, his infamous demon weapon, into the air and was about to ignite the volatile tanks of Prometheum attached to the tank by slicing into it, which was stopped when Abaddon managed to calm Khan down from his enraged state, who then goes back into his passive, fun-loving state. Khan then gives the two traitor guardsmen a pat on the back for their good work and jumps off the hull of the tank as Abaddon asks him on what he was doing. Part I I Khan tells a story on how he was surfing the hijacked hellhound into the rear flank of a lemon rust tank formation and was going to detonate it in a blaze of glory. Khan then whispered to him on how Slanish's and Sinch's influences were powerful in the vengeful spirit. He then asked the guardsmen to drive the hellhound into the warp rift that appeared near them to save the war master. Abaddon assures Khan that this was simply because of a new black crusade forming up and not because he was betraying Khan or anything. The two then share a customary brothist, which caused Sindri to cry out in pain as he crashed into the betrayer's fist. Abaddon then asks Khan for his assistance in his new black crusade, which he agrees to without hesitation as he and the war master share another brothist, which again causes pain for Sindri. Haha, <laughs> thank you. Old friend remarks Abaddon as he is informed that that Aramin's vessel is near, along with Lucius. As Abaddon thinks of more champions to recruit for his time traveling crusade, three names come into mind Doombraid, Khan's most powerful champion, Doomrider one of Slanish's greatest champions, and Aragus the Pillager, one of Abaddon's finest Chaos Lords. He also orders Eliphas to get some Jakaro, which puzzles the rest. Abaddon also asks Khan if he can contact Angren and get him to join his Black Crusade, but the Betrayer could not. Angren is still a vexed over Khan on how he shattered the entire World Eater's Legion single-handedly, which Abaddon understands and proceeds not to recruit the angry Primarch anymore. Nerith then protests, Lord Abaddon, if I may speak, how do you expect the handful of us to summon two demon princes and a dead chaos lord we may be the finest sickers among the legions, but we are not that powerful, my lord. Abaddon, infuriated at this weakness, backhands the sorcerer and yells, you call yourselves sorcerers of Tsinch pathetic either show me now that you are still worthy to serve the dark powers or I will personally throw you into a warp portal myself. 
Narathen stands up and the Cabal fearfully obliges and commences the summoning. As the sorcerers chant their dark verses, the despoiler is informed that Typhus fleet is nearing their location. Yes, it is all going to plan as the changer of ways said it would. Perhaps today, the Imperium of Man will finally fall, Abaddon says confidently to himself. He then contacts Seliphus on the status of the Jacaro, which he replies that he has already dispatched several capture teams to a nearby subsector and will get them shortly. Suddenly, an unexpected warp portal appears in the center of the summoning circle the Cabal was using and in the blink of an eye, a flaming motorcycle jumps out of the portal and screams an accomplishment. It was none other than Doomredder the champion of Slanesh. The odor around him is mixed with the smell of a hundred drugs and combat stimulants, and exotic perfumes and smells, which had mixed effects on everyone in the room, either smelling the different odors or falling into a trace from the drug residue emanating from Doomrider. The champion then asks the Warmaster, I heard that you were throwing another party Lord Abaddon. Do you mind if I join you and cause some OHH so sensual debauchery along the way? Abaddon tells the drug-addled biker that he is indeed commencing another Black Crusade and requires his assistance. Doomrider then takes a 500 milliliter syringe filled with a concentrated cocktail of a hundred different drugs and combat stimulants from his codpiece. Stabs the 10 inch long needle into his skull and injects on the spot. The fire burning on Doomrider's head intensifies tenfold as he then yells, By Slanesh Yeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
Abaddon bitch slaps the demon with his right hand and tells him that he is also about as old as the demon and threatens it with more harm unless it agrees to be bound to the war master's arm. The demon continues to resist as he counters. Foolish human, I am Imgar the Reborn. Prince of the word bearers do not think I would serve such a pathetic creature like you. Brimming with anger and impatience. Abaddon has had enough of this pompous demon and picks up Drachnion and swiftly thrusts the sword into the demon's throat. His head then severs as a key demonic guts spill out. Abaddon then picks up where he left off and fondles around at the warp again with his right hand, again causing Sindri unfathomable pain. Minutes pass as Abaddon gets hold of something again, this time, less powerful than the last. Who will you release me now? It shouts in protest as Abaddon starts pulls it out of the warp in quick succession. Let go I will feed you your own spleen as I break your back and use your throat as a lash. Dog. The warp entity continues to defy as Abaddon's arm starts to crack and buckle under the stress again. However Papa Nurgle still watches over the fearless war master as he continues to pull it out, preventing his arms from further degrading. Shortly after this. Abaddon managed to successfully pull the soul out as it stands as a purple wisp in his hand. It then threatens. Insignificant dog I shall destroy you for the Black Legion which Abaddon responds to by swing Sindri at the soul, hitting it and stunning it with a burst of warp energy. Abaddon then, again in all that is odd, presses the stunned soul against his codpiece and uses Sindri's sorceress powers to bind it into the armor piece. His now raging boner screams. How dare you who the hell do you think I am I am Aragus the pillager master of hounds the lash of the black legion. Abaddon then silences his screaming cod piece as he inform it that he is Abaddon the despoiler, which causes Aragus to ask for forgiveness and ask what can he do to serve him again, which Abaddon replies to by telling him that he will serve in battle once the black crusade begins. Hours pass as the war master now tells Aramon that his black crusade will begin now. Eliphas also informs Abaddon that he has captured a multitude of Jokaro. As all is now in place, Abaddon assembles his champion as he prepares to debrief them of his 14th Black Crusade's ultimate goal, to kill the false emperor as a child. Ensuring that it will be an easy affair for he is still weak and frail, he then tunes into the Vox and informs the ships of the plan to travel 40,000 years into the past to kill the emperor. At first, there was silence amongst the legions of chaos. They could not believe that this is happening. Then they roar out in cheer and appeasement. The fleets of different champions then move into formation as Araman and his cabal starts to bend the warp and begin the trip. Abaddon looks on as light and darkness bends at the sheer speed they are going. Warriors of chaos. It is time for the galaxy to burn for today we will define righteousness Araman shouts over the Vox. Hum. Now where have I heard that speech before Eliphas ponders in his mind. As they continue to travel through time and space, Abaddon sees a multitude of colors, lights, and sequences of it shifting. He feels as if his soul is pulling away from him. Then suddenly something totally unexpected. One of Abaddon's Justerin Terminators enters the room and starts flailing something around while shouting, Lord Abaddon, I finally found your original arms Creed hid them in the engine room. Part III as the Terminator continues to flail the arms around in the air. Abaddon is clearly displeased. In anger, he raises up the still confused champion into the air and scolds him on why in the warp would he would still need his old arms when his new bionic ones are better. Then as the infuriated lord was readying himself to throw the terminator halfway across the room, a bright burning light suddenly appears as it is now engulfing Abaddon's ship. It appears to be an unstable form of warp energy generated by the time travel process. It continues to expand as it consumed everything. In a panicked and vexed voice, Araman yelled, who in the name of Sinch moved Damnet then, in a split second. Abaddon hurled the Terminator he was holding in the air aside and then proceeded to punch the wave of light with his demonically perceived fist and unholy might. As Sindri made contact with the energies, he screamed in agony as his metallic form begins to wither away in the intense heat, as he emitted more violent psychic screams. This appears to weaken the energy field in which Abaddon continues to thrust his burning fist deeper into it and then suddenly, after 30 tenths second, everything exploded in an eruption of warp and eldritch energy. 
Abaddon and everyone in his throne room are knocked back against the wall with two unlucky Chaos Marines after having their bodies obliterated by the flickering warp bolts. As things calm down, Araman reports, Ah, never mind, the anomaly appears to have died down. Ready on your mark again Lord Abaddon. As the fearsome War Master picks himself up, he raises his ruined right arm and observes that it is utterly ruined. Sindri can be heard mewling in pain. As he reorganizes his thought, the War Master orders Ahriman to commence the time travel ritual again. Again the enchanting lights appear as Ahriman and his cabal picks up where they left off. After but a few short seconds, Abaddon opens his eyes. It appears that he is still in the vengeful spirit but nothing much has changed. He wonders if the ritual was a success. Then Ahriman reports over the Vox. Welcome to the past my chaotic brethren everyone roared in joy over the success of the ritual and now know that they are one step closer to beheading the Imperium of Man. Abaddon then tells everyone to stand by and commence diagnostics to see if any of the ships sustain damage and to rest after their ordeal but know that they will move out in a few hours. He marches towards the Jacaro barracks to see how his primate army is faring after the time warp and just outside it he can hear the unnerving screeching of the Xenos. As he opens the door he finds Eliphas in the center with several chunks of fesses hanging from his armor and after a loud sigh, Eliphas says in a sarcastic tone, Welcome to our monkey wonderland Lord Abaddon. May I leave now before my short fused patience burns out and I start spilling monkey blood for the blood god. The war master then proceeds to disconnect his ruined right arm and tell Eliphas that he may leave once the Jokero repairs his arm, which Eliphas reluctantly agrees to as he is again pelted by by monkey excrement. I picked a good day to wear a loyalist terminator helmet. Eliphas remarks to himself as the ball of poo hit him spot on the face. As Abaddon was about to leave the room, Khan suddenly barges in and yells, We're in the past Lord Abaddon isn't this exciting. Abaddon gives Khan a customary brofist with his left arm and then Khan drags the war master over the viewing area. They observe terror before the great crusade, it isn't darted with golden towers and large manufactorums. It is still covered with blue seas, with large patches of green and brown over top. Great white mists coat the atmosphere of the planet. Khan then gets one of his berserker spasms and yells. There must be plenty of blood to spill down there as Abaddon was about to give the order to man the drop pods. A Jokero taps him on the back and presents to him his newly refurbished demon arm. It is now enhanced with higher quality materials and a power field now surrounds it. Abaddon sends the Xenos away as he continues to admire his new chaotic weapon. He then proceeds to ask Sindri how he is faring, which the traumatized demon responds. Monkey fesses. Monkey fesses everywhere as the Chaos Legions prepared to commence their orbital assault. Araman asks the War Master, anything to say to our warriors before they kill the False Emperor, my liege. Abaddon takes a few moments to think on what to say before finally tuning into all the Vox channels to give a short speech before Planetfall. Brothers mark this day it is the day we destroy the very fabric of time it is the day we rewrite history it is the day that never existed and only exists let the universe burn. The deployment shortly begins after Abaddon's speech and numerous drop pods rain down on the surface of terror. Many of the traitorous starts are foaming at the mouth at the mere thought of having a chance of slaying the hated false emperor of man. As the second wave plummets down, which the war master is partaking in, a frantic voice comes over Abaddon's vox. Lord Abaddon, we are under attack from an unknown enemy what are your orders Abaddon? Still unfazed by the attack, orders the Eliphas to round up the Jokero and have them link all of the vengeful spirits multilaser defense systems. As the despoiler continues to order his voices with his vox, a bright lens laser suddenly slices off a hunk of metal near the place where Abaddon's standing which allowed him to see the action outside. It appears that the elder the culprits of this attack. These effete weaklings dare to stand in my way. Abaddon cries out as he rips the hole made by the bright lens even larger as so he could properly aim his weapons. He then raises up his left arm, which is equipped with his Talon of Horus and his demonically possessed arm. The Talon of Horus glows with a blue hue as Tsinge blesses the Talon's built-in storm bolter to fire deadly inferno bolts while his right demon arm fires a flurry of bolts of change. 
which makes short work of the Elder's lightly armored fighters. Dozens of Nightwing fighters are shot down by the Warmaster's unquenchable chaotic fury but the attack is still unfazed and the Elder continue to harass the orbital assault force. As Abaddon continues shooting at the Elder craft, a voice comes over the Vox, saying that the Jacaro have finished linking the multi-laser anti-aircraft system and are ready to shoot down the Elder wretches without fail. Plus plus this section is still incomplete plus plus random Ritterfag. Doom Ridder dies because he went to a time when there is no Slanesh. One ticket there, please. So then Abaddon comes back, launches another Emperor Damned Crusade and then Creed. <laughs>